Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 21. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary person, or rather people. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that as your word has been read, that you would open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. That your word is to be proclaimed, and so may we hear it. May we hear it with joy. Speak to us today, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. In considering Old Testament history, uh, surely the Babylonian captivity was the low point for ancient Israel. I mean, think about this with me. The people who were set apart by God, redeemed from Egyptian slavery, given the law, then ushered into the promised land, established as a nation, they were taken captive by a pagan king and a pagan nation. As the prophet Isaiah put it, Israel nationally and the tribe of Judah specifically was, and I quote, sold for nothing, like worthless property. Despite the punishment of captivity, Israel was not worthless in God's sight, but was the consistent recipient of, think about this, they were the consistent recipient of God's faithful provision, including His precepts, His promises, and His presence. And it's through Israel, as we look back through history, and as, as Paul is helping us see here within Romans, despite their unfaithfulness, and despite their subsequent captivity, God would reveal His glory and the salvation of His people. Good news for Israel, but also, according to Isaiah, good news for all kinds of people. And the promise that all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. How would God save his people? How would his salvation be revealed to the ends of the earth? Well, it's right to ask the question, how, but rather... According to Isaiah, we need to first ask, in whom? In whom? And the way that Isaiah describes him is this way. In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, it says, He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And yet before that, before that exaltation, Isaiah says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah goes on and says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced 
for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And then as if summarizing, reminding us who we are. The prophet says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord... The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now these words are given to Israel prophetically. They're spoken in past tense, emphasizing their imminence. Revealing that God's servant would indeed bear the sin of many and make intercession for the true transgressors. As Christians We're familiar with this prophecy, aren't we? We're familiar, it's read a number of times during the year, we're familiar with Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant. So much so that we forget the context into which it was written and the people to whom it was first written. It was a call for repentance, a declaration of forgiveness, a message for sinners and the hope of salvation, as it is for us today. And just as Israel was captive to the principality of Babylon, so we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But Isaiah proclaimed God's promise of a Savior, a Savior to bear our iniquities, that we might be counted or justified as righteous. And when the fullness of time had come, Paul wrote to the Galatians, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. As God promised through Isaiah, for our sake, God made His only Son, Jesus, to be sin upon the cross so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. This was the fulfillment of the good news or as we translate that Greek word euangelion as the gospel. Proclaimed to Israel first but also proclaimed to the world. In fact, this is how God demonstrated His love. Whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall not perish, but have eternal life. And this is, this is good news. This is the best news, and it's good news worth sharing. A gift of God to be given. A gift of God to be received. A gift of God to to be believed. And so I want to start here with the giving of this gift, the giving of this gift of the gospel. Directing us all the way back to Isaiah's prophecy, Paul quotes the prophet, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. It's a poetic description, isn't it? But of what? It's a poetic description of the delightful delivery of the greatest gift on earth. It is lovely pronouncement of the duty and, yes, the privilege of proclaiming the gospel. But it's also a pragmatic answer. If salvation comes, as Paul has taught us in the preceding verses, if salvation comes through confession that Jesus is Lord and belief that God raised Him from the dead, and if we believe and are justified, and if we confess and are saved, then the question is, How do we hear that gospel in the first place? If we are to confess, if we are to believe, how do we hear the gospel in the first place? If everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, then how are they to call on one they have never believed in? I mean, it makes no sense at all. And how are they to believe in one they have not heard of. And really, think about this. How can they confess that Jesus is Lord? How can they believe that God raised Him from the dead if they have never heard of Jesus, of His righteous life? 
of his sacrificial death, of his victorious resurrection and his ongoing heavenly reign unless, unless someone tells them about him. No one believes a gospel they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching, Paul asks rhetorically. There must be a preacher. There must be a proclaimer of the good news. The problem is, is that the duty and the privilege have been distorted and deferred to someone else. And if someone else, often no one else at all. Part of the problem, I think, is our translation and our interpretation. The Greek word kariso and euangelizi, euangelizo, easy for you to say, euangelizo, I think they're rightly translated here in our English translation. They're translated as to preach or to preach the gospel. But when we hear preach, what do we often think of? We hear preach, we often think of that word in the terms of vocation and occasion, right? We think that the preacher preaches the gospel from the pulpit, and we pray that he does. But oftentimes we translate that in our own minds, and especially in our actions as, so if the preacher preaches the gospel from the pulpit, let's leave the preaching to the preacher. I think Eugene Peterson's paraphrase helps rescue this verse from misinterpretation. Translating this verse as, How can they hear if nobody tells them? How is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? You see, everyone needs to hear the gospel. Someone must tell them. So the question is, who Will it be? The answer is, of course, you and me and all who are in Christ. We are those who are commissioned to go. We are the mobilizing means of saving the lost instruments, if you will, in our Redeemer's hands. But often, we are our own worst enemies keep me ourselves from the duty and privilege of evangelism by the compromise of our conduct and our communication. When the world sees your legalism, when the world sees your licentiousness in your conduct, they have no desire to hear about your Lord. When the testimony of your flesh shouts louder, then your telling of the truth of the gospel, no one has ears to hear. They simply look, they simply listen to the preaching of your life. When what you say contradicts what you believe, who's going to believe you? For example, when our words or maybe we should bring this into a modern perspective, when your posts or tweets or shares, <laughs> when they shame, when they divide, when they alienate, don't think anybody is going to believe your gospel. And don't think you make it better by putting that Bible verse on that social media account. Ah, stop it. Instead, we should ask, well, what I am saying well, what I'm saying keeps someone from hearing the gospel. As your grandmother said, some things are better left unsaid, right? <laughs> so how, how we act and what we say really does matter. What Paul said that the Philippians, I pray, would be said of all of us. That we are all to shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Jesus said to you, and he said to me, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. 
and he gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And our light, our light, to stay with the metaphor, our light shines brightest when we are giving what the world needs most. Though we are a people, let's be clear, we are not perfect. We are, as we say, a people with feet of clay. But we're also a people who have a beautiful gift to give. But Isaiah says that the feet of those who preach the gospel, the good news are beautiful. Now, I do not think of my feet, nor does anyone in my family think of my feet as beautiful. Right? Maybe you have model feet, right? But the feet are a metaphor, of course, referring to what? Referring to carrying, referring to sharing the gospel. Why beautiful? Feet that carry the gospel are beautiful because they are the mobilizing means of God's love for the lost. And that is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing to love our neighbor considering the love with which God loved us. And there is no greater gift of love to give than the gift of the gospel. Yes, loving our neighbor requires hum humility. Requires us valuing others higher than we value ourselves. It requires peaceably living with everyone as it is up to you. It requires self-sacrifice, or I love the way that the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians. He, said, he refers to spending and being spent. And it also requires a sincere relationship. We're not machine gun evangelists, but we are friends. We are neighbors. We are family. J.I. Packer says, the enterprise required of us in evangelism is the enterprise of love. An enterprise that springs from a genuine interest in those whom he, we seek to win and a genuine care for their well-being and expresses itself in a genuine respect for them and a genuine friendliness towards them. In short, sharing the gospel requires the love of God the same love with which he has loved us. And so, we are sharing the gift of the gospel that it may be received. Those who are to receive the gift. If we share the gift in love for our neighbor, what part's our responsibility and what part is God's responsibility? Is the burden of the lost, is the burden of the dying world resting on your ability, how good of a pitch you make, how persuasive you are, is that what it depends upon? In short, as my kids hate to hear me say, <coughs> wrong answer. No way. No. The gospel is a gift from God. We simply our delivery people, right? We deliver the gift as Christ's servants. As Paul says, we are stewards of the mystery of God. We deliver the gift by sharing it in its simplicity, but also its profundity. As Paul put it to the Corinthians, I decided to know, you know the rest of the verse, I decided to know nothing. Except what? Except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul didn't want anything getting in the way. Narrow it down to its simplicity and its profundity. And we deliver the gift as ambassadors for Christ. For Christ's sake, we deliver the gospel. Entrusted with the message of reconciliation. A message that the world needs of reconciliation between God and man. Delivering the gift of the gospel does not, however, mean that it will always be received. Isaiah delivered the gospel to Israel. They 
heard it, but they did not obey it. As Paul accounts in our passage today, Isaiah lamented, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Undoubtedly, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, but hearing does not guarantee believing, even truth from the mouth of God. But this does not deter our advancing of the gospel to our neighbor and to the nations. Quoting from the 19th Psalm, and this is fascinating to biblical scholars, quoting from the 19th Psalm here in Romans, Paul reinterprets this portion of Psalm 19, a portion of the scripture that in its context is spoken of the general revelation of God's glory to the world. But here, fascinatingly enough, Paul reinterprets it to talk about the spreading or the advancing of the gospel to the ends of the earth. He says their voice, quoting from Psalm 19, as we sang this morning, their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now think about that in the context of Psalm 19 a psalm that many of us know, a psalm that we sang in our worship today, just as the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork, and just as day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge, so God, in His sovereign purpose, has ordained that the gospel be given and received by every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, advancing throughout the world. And consider how you and I are recipients of this glorious advancement. I mean, think about this. This is really hard to believe. Jerusalem is 6,700 miles from where we are at this point. And if you don't believe me, or if I'm wrong, just check Google, right? But I I think that's right. 6,700 miles The beginning and the advancement of the gospel spread all the way to Fort Smith, Arkansas. We're separated by over 2,000 years from Jesus' resurrection. And yet, we're assembled this morning. Despite the distance, despite the time, we're assembled this morning on the Lord's Day in Christ's church doing what? Worshiping the one true God in spirit and in truth through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. This God purposed. And He purposed it for His glory. And this got accomplished through Christians like you and like me. Our ancestors did not know. And and we don't know either who will believe the gospel. But you can't ever believe Unless you receive. And so the gift of the gospel is worth sharing. And it's worth sharing with the world. And so finally, I want us to look at believing. Believing this gift of the gospel. As good as the good news is, we might wonder, if it's that good, why doesn't everyone believe? Why doesn't everyone believe this good news? But even to those whom Christ came first did not believe. God says in verse 21, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. But in striking contrast, look up at the preceding verse. Verse 20, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between the contrary people and those who did not seek the Lord but found Him? One people were a nation established by God. The other people were no nation at all and far from God. What's the difference between the two? Those who were once not a people had become God's people. Those who had not received mercy, received mercy. And so God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. To which Paul adds, so then it depends not on human will, 
or exertion, but on God who has mercy. The difference between the believing and the unbelieving is that believing the gift of the gospel requires the gift of faith. Believing the gift of the gospel requires the gift of faith. But for the grace of God, you would never have believed the gospel. But for the grace of God, I would never have believed the gospel. Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, God's gift of faith is His to give. It's not yours to give. It's not mine to give. Yes, He includes us. And how does He include us? Well, He includes us with those beautiful feet, with the caring and the sharing and the advancing of the gospel. But believing the gospel is exclusively of God. As J.I. Packer puts it succinctly, evangelism is man's work, but the giving of faith is God's. And so believing in the gift is a gift. And this must, this must inform our evangelism as Christians. We cannot make someone believe, even those we love most. But we must be faithful to give the gift of the gospel. Praying that the giver of all good things will give the gift of faith. For God is glorified through the salvation of his people. And through the gift of the gospel, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, how great is the good news of salvation in Christ alone. And we thank you that by your grace, we your people have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have called upon Him and be saved by Your mercy in Your grace. And so we ask that we who are a believing people may be a going and sharing people. May we be faithful to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be faithful to go unto the nations that You may be glorified through the salvation of Your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.